we continue our discussion about the relations that we started yesterday and let me remind you in particular we discussed two special types of relations namely equivalence relations that is one type and second was partial order and let us uh, discuss a few more things about the partial order. Um, let us say that uh, x is a set and say less than or equal to is a partial order on x. So, this is a partially ordered set. By the way, let me emphasize once again that though here I am using this notation less than or equal to, it does not mean that it is the usual less than or equal to order among the numbers. Okay. It is any partial order. Okay. This is just a notation and this is something which is fairly common in this study of this order relations. Okay. Usual partial order is denoted by this symbol and, and the uh, partial order among the numbers, the usual less than or equal to relation is one special case of this partial order. We should also uh, use the usual notations which we use in case of the usual partial order that you know. For example, uh, suppose we have two num uh, two elements a, b in x. Okay, uh, let us say with a less than or equal to b. Okay, uh, we will also uh, this is same. We can also denote this as the by this b bigger than or equal to a. Okay, so this will be just nothing but reverse partial order. It is it basically means the same thing. Okay. Okay, just a different notation. Okay. Similarly, uh, a strictly less than b. Okay, by this will be a less than or equal to b and a not equal to b. Okay, a not equal to b. Okay. And similarly, and this will we can denote this also by this symbol b bigger than a. Okay, if there is some m in x such that a is less than or equal to m for every a in a. Okay. And then this element m that is called upper bound, upper bound we will use the standard short form u b for a upper bound of or for a upper bound of a. Remember that uh, of course, in general a set may or may not be bounded above. Okay. In general a set may or may not be bounded above. So, it is bounded above it should have an upper bound. Also uh, notice here that it is m it is not said that m belongs to a. Okay. That upper bound did not be an element of a. Okay. It is any element of x. Okay. Upper bound did not be in a. Okay. Second thing is that this upper bound did not be unique. Okay. For example, suppose you take some element in x which is bigger than or equal to this m, then that will also satisfy this, right? Because of transitivity relation, suppose you have let us say n and m is less than or equal to n, then since a is less than or equal to m, m is less than or equal to n, a will also be less than or equal to n. So any other n which is bigger than or equal to m will also be an upper bound. So upper bound is in general not unique. Okay. So we'll also discuss another similar concept, what is called least upper bound. least upper bound least upper bound which is called lub again the standard short form okay least upper bound means what of course first of all it should be an upper bound because and it should be smaller than any other upper bound okay. right that's that's the thing okay so least upper bound is so let let me say uh, a number okay suppose so uh, let us say I will call that number let us say p not number any element p in x is called this least upper bound I will simply write l u b of a if two things first thing is that p is an upper bound of a. What does this mean? It means a less than or equal to p for every small a in a that is the first thing it satisfies this property. Second thing is that if you take any upper bound for example m if m is an upper bound of a then m then p is less than or equal to m okay. that is the meaning of this. Okay. The second property is this if m is an upper bound of a then 
P is less than or equal to M. Okay. This least upper bound is also sometimes called supremum, just the same concept but different supremum that is same as least upper bound. And we shall be using both these terms quite frequently. All right. Now, is it clear to you that uh, in general an upper bound may or may not be unique, okay? but least upper bound will be unique always. That is clear. For example, suppose P and Q are two least upper bounds. Okay. Then by the second property, since P is a least upper bound and Q is an upper bound, you must have P less than or equal to Q. Similarly, reverse the roles. So, Q less than or equal to P and by the by the anti symmetry property p must be equal to q okay so even though upper bound may or may not be unique least upper bound will always be unique okay of course remember none of these things may exist okay what all that we are saying is that if least upper bound exists it must be unique okay so let us just mention that least upper bound of a if exists is unique In a similar way, uh, we can define what is meant by saying that a set is bounded below, okay. what is meant by a lower bound okay. and what is meant by greatest lower bound. Okay. And in a similar way, we can show that a, in general lower bound may not be unique, okay, but the greatest lower bound will always be unique. Okay. Let us, since all those things are very similar to whatever we have discussed in this case, okay, we shall not go into the detailed discussion on this. Okay. So, that means, what is it that I am uh, talking about? First of all, what is meant by bounded below? Okay. Lower bound, greatest lower bound, greatest lower bound. And again, just as this LU be the standard short form of least upper bound, GLB is the standard short form of greatest lower bound. Okay. And corresponding to this supremum, greatest lower bound is also called infimum. And in a similar way, one can show that if, if uh, uh, infimum exists, it must be unique. Okay. If infimum exists, it must be unique. Okay. Now, let us also discuss one more concept which is very similar to this upper bounds etcetera. It is called a uh, maximal element. Okay. It is slightly different from an upper bound. Okay. Uh, let, let me talk of maximal element in x. Okay. Let us say that m long equal to x is called a maximal element. It means there is nothing bigger than this m. Okay. It means there is nothing bigger than this m in x. Okay. So, one of the ways of writing that is that x if a belongs to x and m less than or equal to a, that is if at all there is anything bigger than or equal to m, then it must coincide with m. Okay. Then A equal to M. Okay. Now try to understand that there is a difference between a maximal element and, a, and, a, and an upper bound. Okay. In an upper bound, for example, suppose M is an upper bound of X, what will that mean? It will mean that A is less than or equal to M for, for every 
every a. Okay. Now, this is not what we are saying for a maximal element, we are not saying something like that. Okay. We are not saying that a is less than or equal to m for every a. All that we are saying is that if m is less than or equal to a, okay, then a must coincide with m. That is, there is nothing strictly bigger than m in x, that is all. Okay. That is called maximal element. Uh, I think if we take the examples, it will be clear. Let me recall this example. Okay. We had taken the example of this set of all natural numbers. Okay. And we, in this, we had defined this order m. Uh, okay, let me use the same notation again m less than or equal to n. This means the not in the usual sense of less than or equal to, this means m divides n, right. This means we had seen that this is a partial order, okay. This is a partial order. Now, this time what I will do is that instead of taking the whole set n, instead of taking the whole set n, I will take only let us say this set. Suppose I take this set as x. 1, 2, let us say up to 10, okay, and with this order, with this partial order, okay. Take first 10 natural numbers and consider the order m less than or equal to n means m divides n, okay. All right. Does this set has uh, have any any maximal elements? 10 is a maximal element, fine, okay. Is 10 an upper bound? Yeah. <coughs> 10 is an upper bound of x? Think, think carefully. What is the definition of upper bound? Yes. For an upper bound, what we require that every element here must be less than or equal to 10, okay. For example, suppose you take the element 3. Is this true? Is this true? No. No. That means 10 is not an upper bound. Okay. 10 is not an upper bound. That's clear. But 10 is a maximal element. Okay. So there's a difference between a maximal element and upper bound. And this is this happens when it's a partial order. Okay. Because certain elements may not be comparable at all. Okay. For an upper bound, what we require is that it should be bigger than or equal to every element in that set. That means it must be comparable with every every other element. Okay. And bigger than or equal to. Okay. But for maximal element, we are not saying that. Okay. But is is the is this ten only maximal element? Are there other maximal elements? What about nine? Nine is maximal. Are you saying that? Is is this true? Are, are you saying this? That's not true, right? Okay. So ten is not greater than nine. Okay. In this in this order. Okay. So, is there any element which is greater than nine in 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 this set X? No. No. So, does that mean that nine is a maximal element? Yes. Okay. Nine is a maximal element. Is that clear? Nine is a maximal element. Okay. What about eight? Yes. It's also a maximal element. Okay. Right. So, now do you understand the difference between a maximal element and an upper bound? Okay. Now, this should be very clear in your mind because these concepts are important, okay, right. This is because uh, this is not a total order, okay. In this x, you will have two elements which may not be comparable to each other at all, okay. And once, if, if that is the case, if the elements are not comparable, then there may not be any upper bound, okay. Yes, yes, we have an example. For example, what are all the, in fact, you can list all the maximal, we already see 8, 9, 10, all of them are maximal elements, okay. You can verify yourself that 6, 7, these are also maximal elements. What about 5? No, 5 is not, because there is 10 there and 5 is less than, okay, right, okay, okay. Let us take one more example of this type, okay. Mm. Let us start with a set which contains, let us say, 3 elements. And we will consider, uh, okay. we will consider first this say power set of this, okay. How many elements this power set will have? Eight, 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 eight elements, okay. So, what are those eight elements? Since there are eight we can list, right. There are eight elements we can list. So, empty sets, then these three singleton sets A, B, C and then uh, these three set A B, 
B C A C and then the last set A B C, which okay. have we accounted for all? Okay, all right. Now, what I will do is that instead of taking this whole set, we already seen that this is a partially ordered set okay, with set inclusion. Okay. That is, this is a partial order on this set. Right. Now, instead of this, I will take this set X as, I will remove this last set from here. Now, is that clear that, okay, so let me, let me first, before going to that, let me just again go back to this. Okay. Does, does this set have an upper bound with respect to this order? And what is that? This one, okay. This is an upper bound okay. because this set is uh, given any element here, it is less than or equal to this. Okay, so that is an upper bound. And what I plan to do now is that precisely remove that element. Okay, that is, I will just remove this element from here. And okay, it is obviously now not two to the power. Right? It is x with respect to the same order. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, now does this set have an upper bound? Yeah. It is. Which, which which is an upper bound? A B C. B C. No, that's. But that is not here in the set. Okay. But upper bound need not be in the set. Okay, but now I am considering only this set. Okay. Now I am considering partial order only on this set. I am not considering anything outside this. Okay. Fine. Fine. This whole A B C will be an upper bound for this, but I am not considering let us say elements outside this set. So inside the set there is no upper bound. Okay. All right. Does it have a maximal element? Think yes. carefully. Yes. 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 A B C. A B C C. Yeah. For example, okay. Let, let us look at this. Take this set A B. Okay. Right. Is there is there any set in this which is which contains this A B other than this? Right. No other set is bigger than this. Okay. Right. So this is a maximal element. Right. And the same thing can be said about B C A C etc. Okay. All these three are maximal elements. What about this? No, no, okay. no, BC contains. They are not. Uh, they are not maximal elements, right? Okay. So is this is this clear to you now? The difference between an upper bound and a maximal element. See, usually if an upper bound belongs to the set A itself, then it is called a maximum element. Okay, right? If an upper bound lies inside the set A itself, then it is called a maximum element of A. Okay, but there is a difference between a maximum element and maximal element. Okay. Okay. There is a difference between a maximum element and maximal element. You, it should be. In fact, that is the first thing that should be very clear to you in in your mind. Okay. All right. Okay. Then we'll go. In a since the discussion will be very parallel to what we are discussed about the maximal element, I shall not go into the details of that. In a similar way, you can define what is meant by minimal element. What will be a minimal element? We'll say that uh, okay. I'll say instead of this m, so let us say l is will be called a minimal element. If instead of this m less than or equal to a, we will have a less than or equal to l. Then that should imply l is equal to a. Okay. That is, if there is anything less than a given element, okay, then that should element should coincide. This. That is a that is the definition of minimal element. And minimal element is not same as lower bound. It is not same as list element. And similarly, you can construct examples of that. I shall not go into detailed discussion of that because that is uh, that is very much similar to whatever we have discussed about the maximal element. Okay. Now we discuss one very important question: When does a partially ordered set have a maximal element? Right. And the answer to that is given by a very well known uh, principle of set theory, uh, it is called Zorn's lemma. And this is a lemma which will be used in many proofs of very well known theorems. But anyway, before going to that, let us first see what exactly this lemma says okay 
this says when does a partially ordered set have a maximal element. Okay. So, so let us say that uh, let x let's call it to be a partially ordered set. Okay. So, if every chain in x if every chain in x has an upper bound remember chain means totally ordered set okay suppose you take a totally ordered subset of x okay so suppose every such totally ordered subset has an upper bound okay suppose you take every then then x has a maximal element We shall not go into the proof of this Jost lemma. That is because it is actually one of the axioms of set theory. Okay. We don't prove it. Okay. Um, <laughs> in my first lecture, I told you about axiom of choice, okay. and axiom of choice of one version of that is that if the you take a family of non-empty sets, then its product is also non-empty. Another, of course, we can also restate it in, by making use of the concept of choice functions, etc. It can be shown that the axiom of choice and John's lemma are equivalent. Okay. That means, if you assume axiom of choice, you can prove John's lemma and conversely, if you assume John's lemma, you can prove axiom of choice. Okay. But we shall not discuss any of these proofs that is uh, because this is not a course on set theory because those kind of things will take lot of time. We are basically just reviewing certain things in set theory which we shall require in the real analysis course. Okay. And let me again say that this John's lemma is used uh, in many proofs of the standard theorems, not only in analysis, but in many other courses. For example, in linear algebra, in order to prove that every vector space has a basis, you have to make use of this uh, John's lemma. Okay. Whenever you learn that proof, you will see that you require John's lemma. All right. Now, let us go to the uh, next uh, topic. Uh, we will I'll suspend the discussion about the partial order for the time being. We now want to say something about the number of elements in a set okay, and how that is how one goes about that. Okay. So, again suppose let us say A and B are two sets empty or non empty I do not bother about it right now. Okay. Then we define what is meant by saying that A is numerically equivalent to B. And we shall use this notation for that. Okay, notation. We shall use this notation. A is numerically equivalent to B. Okay. <coughs> if there exists a bijection between A and B, okay. that is, there should exist a map from A to B, which is one one and on two. Okay. So let us say that A is said to be. numerically equivalent to be this is the rotation if there exists f from a to b which is okay either you can say 1 1 and on 2 or a bijection okay Basically, this is a notation which says that A and B have the same number of elements. Okay. That is the meaning of saying that A is numerically equivalent to B. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let us take this set of all natural numbers. Okay. 
uh, let me also remind you we have we have defined what is meant by a function okay right a fun in general a function is a rule which takes suppose you are taking to set function is a rule which takes from a to b a is called uh, domain and b is called codomain okay. if this domain is the set of all natural numbers then that function is called a sequence right sequence is nothing but a function whose domain is the set of all natural numbers then this set b can be anything okay it can be real numbers rational numbers complex numbers any other objects matrices if it is a matrices it will be sequence of matrices if it is functions it will be sequence of functions it's sequence of real numbers etc okay this is a concept of sequence which we shall discuss in more detail little later for example we, when you take a sequence of real numbers what is meant by a convergent sequence etc but here uh, all that i uh, re require you to know right now is that if if you have a sequence then you can arrange the elements of the sequence like this x1 x2 etc okay right <coughs> that is you can label the elements of the sequence as uh, x1 that is x1 is nothing but f of 1 x2 is nothing but f of 2 etc okay all right now coming back to this uh, numerical equivalence suppose this is the set n that is the set of all natural numbers suppose we take only the first n natural numbers we take the first n natural numbers we shall denote that say okay we shall use some name for this suppose i will call it j suffix n okay that is 1 2 etc up to n this is called segment of n now before proceeding further let us make one very obvious observation okay obvious in certain sense suppose i take two such segments jm and jn jm and jn okay when will this happen jm is numerically equivalent to jn if and only if m is equal to n okay so that is the first observation so if and only if m is equal to n okay okay let me just write this as a theorem again i will not go into the discussion of the proof of this proof is fairly easy okay in fact if m is equal to n there is nothing to prove right is a identity map okay you can take zn to zn as identity map that will be 1 1 and on to but only thing is that if j m is numerically equivalent to j n then proving that m is equal to n that will require some work but it is also not very difficult okay. or another way of showing the same thing is that if m is different from n then there can be no bijection between j m and j n that is little easy to show but that will also take some time but I, I suggest that you try to do it on your own okay. if there is any difficulty then we shall discuss that in the class okay. All right. <coughs> now, then let us go to next uh, concept suppose we take a as any set okay a is any set then a is said to be finite is said to be finite if a is empty if a is empty or a is numerically equivalent to one of these segments okay a is numerically equivalent to one of this segment. If A is equivalent to J n for some okay. Okay. Now for such finite sets suppose a is a finite set uh, we will define what is meant by cardinality of a okay and instead of writing this full cardinality we shall use this short notation cardinality of a card a 
okay. This is this we shall define as this number n, okay. This number n if it is non empty, if it is empty we will define it to be 0. Okay. So, cardinality of a to be defined as 0 if a is an empty set is equal to n if a is numerically equivalent to z n. Yes. Uh, a is equal to empty set, that is right. Thank you. If, if A is equal to empty set and it is n if A is numerically equivalent to j n. Okay. And can, can A be numerically equivalent to two different uh, uh, segments? Is it possible that A is numerically equivalent to j 4 and j 7? Seven? No, right. So, that means this number n will be unique if once A is a finite, in fact, that is what is this observation. Okay. That is what is this observation, okay. The m is numerically equivalent to the n that will happen only if and only if m is equal to n. So, given a finite set, it can be numerically equivalent to only one of the j n's, exactly one of the j n's, or else it should be empty, okay. Or else, okay. All right. And what we have called this cardinality of a, roughly, uh, not roughly, it, it basically means the number of elements in a set a, okay. Cardinality of a is nothing but the number of elements in a set. And what is what is the definition? It is that number n such that a is uh, such that there is a 1 1 correspondence between a and j n, okay, between a and j n. Okay. Mm. One thing follows from this okay, and that is the following. If a is a finite set and suppose you take any proper subset of a, okay, then there can be no bijection between those two sets right okay so why this will happen because uh, if a is a if if you take any set any subset a of b okay then b also will be numerically equivalent to one of these jms okay one of these jms okay and then or uh, one of the jms and then again we use this there will be no bijection if m is different from n okay if m is different from n so, we can say that a finite set cannot be numerically equivalent to any proper subset of itself, right. Of course, one can first show it here, okay. In fact, it follows from here, okay. If you take any proper subset of this, okay, it will be numerically equivalent to some j n m where m is different from n, okay. and hence there can be no uh, bijection between those two sets, okay. So, let us just make this observation a finite set. cannot be numerically equivalent to a finite set cannot be numerically equivalent to its proper subset. And once we define what is meant by a finite set, the definition of infinite set is clear, okay. right. Whatever is not finite is infinite, okay. So, we will we'll say that A is of called an infinite set if it is not a finite set, okay. So, infinite, this means not finite. What does it mean? First of all, it means that it is not empty. Okay. So, it is infinite means first of all, it is not empty and it is not, there is no 1 1 on, on 2 map between A and any of these segments. Okay. For no n, A is numerically equivalent to j n. That is the meaning of saying it, it is not a finite set. Okay. It is an infinite set. Okay. And okay, one obvious example of an infinite set is this okay. for set of all natural numbers it is easy to show that this is not numerically equivalent to any of this because if you take any such segment you will obviously find one element which is outside this okay <coughs> we will see that this property is not true for infinite sets okay 
in case of infinite sets you can easily find subsets uh, which are numerically equivalent to the given sets and one can very easily find such subsets but just for the sake of uh, completeness we will just take one example like this let us say take the set n 1 2 3 etcetera okay and we will take some yeah fine we will take another set suppose x is 2 4 6 etcetera etcetera so this is a proper subset of x right sorry proper subset of n And what is the what is the one one onto map between n and x? Yeah, so we just define f from let us say n to x by uh, f of n is equal to two n. Okay, for then f is one one and onto. Okay. Okay. Now the next obvious question. Okay, should such a thing happen for every infinite set? Here we have given an example. Okay, n is an infinite set. Okay, n is an infinite set, and uh, n has a proper subset which is numerically equivalent to n. Okay. Now the obvi obvious question is: Suppose you are given not necessarily n but any infinite set. Okay, will it always contain a proper subset which is numerically equivalent to itself? Okay. The answer is yes. It is not obvious. It will require some work. Okay. and let us now proceed to do do that work and to do that we'll need one more definition and let one one result among the infinite sets we make some one further subdivision okay we say that a set is countably infinite okay if it is numerically equivalent to n okay it is if it is numerically equivalent to n so we'll say that this is the definition let us say a is a set A is said to be countably infinite. Countably infinite if A is numerically equivalent to n. Okay, that means there is a one-one and onto map between A and The set of all natural numbers. Okay. For example, this set X, two, four, six, etc. This is a countably infinite set. Okay. And okay, we'll also use another term, what is called countable. Countable means finite. Or countably infinite. Okay, countable means finite or countably infinite. <coughs> In fact, there is a reason for this word countable. As the word suggests, it means that elements in the sets can be counted. Okay. Because what is the meaning of countable? Finite means it's numerically equal. If it is empty set, we can forget about it. If it is not empty, it is either numerically equal to one of these zones or to the whole of n. Okay. If it is equal to one of these zones, I can write element. It has n elements, and I can write those elements as a one, a two, etc. If it is numerically equal to n, we can still write the elements as a one, a two, etc. But only thing is there will be no last element. Okay. So when the set is countable. its elements can be arranged in certain order okay first we can talk of what is first element what is second element etc okay? and they can be counted in that order and that is why it is called countable so if a uh, using the language of a sequence if a set is countable you can view the elements of the set a as a sequence okay as a range of a sequence okay if it is countably infinite if it is finite then you can you can just write those elements as a1 a2 an etc Then, before proceeding further, let me also say something about this terminology. Okay. Unfortunately, this terminology is not followed in all books. Okay. Uh, certain authors use some other uh, 
terms, what we have called countably infinite is also called denumerable. Okay, denumerable. Okay, that is Rudin. Rudin uses the word denumerable. And what is worse is some books use countable for this. Denumerable. What is called what what we had, we had countably infinite. Some books use countable for this. Okay. And then what we have called countable, they call at most countable. Okay. So that that is something you should remember when you are looking at a book. Okay. Right in the beginning, you see how those terms are defined, and then uh, then see subsequent things. Okay. But we shall follow this notation. Okay. For us, countable uh, denumerable is same as countably infinite, and countable means finite or countably infinite. Now, let us uh, go to what we were having in mind, namely about showing that every infinite set uh, has a proper subset which is numerically equivalent to itself. But even before going to that, we need one more uh, fact. Okay. Let me write it as a theorem. Okay. Uh, it is the following every infinite set. has a countably infinite subset see by the way before uh, going to this okay suppose i make a following statement that every countably infinite set has a proper subset which is numerically equivalent to it. Is that clear to you? Yes. Right? Because if it is a countably infinite subset, I can write the elements as a1, a2, etc. Then take the subset like this a2, a4, etc. That will be and you can easily establish a 1-1 one -one correspondence between this. Okay? Right? All right. Now, is this clear to everybody? Okay? Okay. Now, suppose I prove this theorem. Will it imply that every uh, every infinite set has a countably infinite subset okay and that countably infinite subset has a set which is numerically equivalent to itself okay so will it immediately mean that every infinite set has a proper subset okay. for example suppose let us say you you started with a set a okay suppose this is an infinite set that you started with okay and suppose b is a countably infinite subset okay Right. Now, this B will have a proper subset. Suppose I call that set as C. So, let us say C as a proper subset of B. Such that B is numerically equivalent to C. Okay. Right. Then, from that, can we say immediately that? Uh, can we say immediately that uh, A has a proper subset which is numerically equivalent to A? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Tell me how. C union A minus B. That's right. Right. You, what you do is see. You already know that there is a map one one and onto map between B and C. Okay. Then for those elements which are outside B, you just consider identity map. Okay? That is, take a map. See, there, there is a map. Let us say F from B to C. This is one one and onto. Okay. Right. Now what I will do is that I will consider a map from let us say G. From A to, uh, okay. Um, I'll write this set later. Okay. The map is defined like this: g of x is equal to f of x for x in B, and equal to just x for x in A minus B. Okay. There is those elements which are outside B. I will take g of x as simply x, and those elements which are inside B, I will take g of x is equal to f x. Okay. Right? Is it obvious that this will be one one and onto? Okay. Okay, but now what is the what is the range of this map? Okay, see because the, the elements which are in B those go to C, okay, right? And the elements which are in A minus B, those will go to A minus B, right? So C union A minus B, right? Right? And is that a proper subset of A? Yeah, because we have removed the elements, so this is not same as B, right? A minus, not uh, yeah A minus B, right? Okay. We have removed the elements which are in B but not in C, okay, which are in B but not in C. 
So, this is a proper subset of A and that is numerically equivalent to A. Okay. So, once we prove this theorem, okay, let me write it as a corollary. Okay. Uh, every infinite set every infinite set has a proper subset proper subset that is numerically equivalent to itself Of course, we have not yet proved the theorem, but assuming that we have proved the theorem, then this corollary will immediately follow from this theorem. This is the proof of that corollary which I have discussed just now. Okay. And what it means is that this is the fact which differentiates between finite and infinite set. Okay. A finite set cannot have a proper subset which is numerically equivalent to it, and an infinite set will always have a proper subset which is numerically equivalent to itself. And that is why in some books, this is taken as a definition of infinite set. Okay. This is taken as a definition of an infinite set and then you define a finite set as the one which is not infinite etcetera. Okay. That is another approach of dealing uh, going for the whole things. Okay. Uh, let us now come to the proof of this. Okay, let us say that the set is let let A be the given set. Okay. Let A be an infinite set. Let A be we want to show that A contains a countably infinite subset. Okay. All right. First of all, can A be empty? It cannot be empty, right? So since let A be infinite, then A is not empty. And what is the meaning of saying that A is not empty? There exists at least one element. Okay. So, A then A is not empty. Let suppose I call that element A1, let A1 belong to A. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, consider a minus a 1. Okay, that is remove that element a 1 from the set A. Okay. Can this set be finite? Why? Why? If it is finite, it will mean that there will exist some n such that a minus a 1 is numerically equivalent to j n. Okay. That means there is a 1 1 and on to map between a minus a 1 and this set 1 to n. Okay. Then what you can do is that you can map this a 1 to n plus 1. Okay. Then a will be numerically equivalent to the segment j n plus 1 and that will make a to be finite, right? which is not the case. Okay. So, this is an infinite set. Okay. If it is an infinite set, it has to be non empty. Okay. So, a minus a 1, this must be non empty. This must be non empty. Okay. Then what follows from this again? If it is a non-empty, there must be some element in that. I will call that element A2. Okay. I will call that element A2. Okay. So then, then A2 belongs to A minus A1. Okay. Then what is to be done after this is clear? Okay. Now consider A minus A1, A2. A 1 and A 2 are different now, okay, because A 2 is not same as A 1, right. A 2 is taken from A minus A 1, okay, so it is different from A 1. Okay. A minus A 1, A 2 is also not finite by the same argument again. Okay. And then proceeding in this way at the n stage or suppose you follow this procedure for n steps, you will get the elements A 1, A 2, A n. Then consider A minus A 1, A 2, A n. That is also not empty. That is also not empty. Okay. So, what it means is that you can find one more element there that element is a suppose you call that element a n plus 1 okay remember a n plus 1 is different from all of this a 1 a 2 a n okay 
and this is the unending process. You can continue in this way. Continuing in this way, what you will get? You will get a sequence. Okay, you will get a sequence. So you can fill up the details. We'll I'll simply say proceeding in this way. This way, we get a1, a2, etc., an. Okay. Okay. And all these elements are distinct. Okay. All these elements are distinct, such that uh, a i not equal to a z for all i not equal to z. Okay. Now, what is the next thing to do? You just collect all these elements a1, a2, n. That is a countably infinite subset of a. Right. Okay. So, let b be equal to a1, a2, etc., etc. Then b is a countably infinite subset of a. Okay. And that completes the proof of the theorem. Okay. All right. We will stop with that. We will consider some more properties of this countable and sets, etc., in the next class.